that there is national interest in this topic as it comes as no great surprise to us. And we have several people participating from outside of Alaska on today's call as well. Um, Mark, uh, over the years, over the decades, you have done so much in Alaska on not only uh, public policy issues, but uh, energy policy issues that shape our state. I think blue fuels is going to be one of those items that we're going to hear uh, kind of the overall viewpoint, first of all, from you, what the, the opportunities and challenges may be. And I think it'll create a platform for additional discussions on policy as we go forward. So greatly appreciate you doing this. And um, I'm going to, without further ado, turn it over to you. I'd like to mention that we have several uh, speakers that have indicated an interest in talking before our group. And uh, John Hendricks with Fury is one of the ones that's available in the over the next couple of weeks before the holiday uh, season, which seems to be longer than usual this year uh, or shorter than usual, depending on where you're quarantining. Uh, so anyway, uh, Mark, uh, please take it away. And, you know, if anyone, in addition to using the chat feature, if anyone has a very pertinent question, is there a way to like uh, flag it and somehow get you to stop and define it further? Because sometimes at that point, it would be beneficial. And um, Wynette, I'll ask you if the best way to do that. Um, yeah, we can certainly do it. But I, again, I would just uh, suggest that people ask the question in chat and um, I'll, uh, I'll interrupt Mark very rudely and, and, uh, <laughs> and try. Good, good. He question. doesn't mind. <laughs> okay, all right. Mark? All right, take it away, Mark. Thank you. Let me go ahead and move to share screen, see if we can get that up and running. Let me see a thumbs up from Juanetta or um, Aaron to say, all right, good, we're good. All right, well, thank you very much for inviting me uh, today. Uh, Mariana, I appreciate the, the opportunity. Let me offer that uh, for today's presentation, I don't have any clients in this space. And uh, this really is a high level reconnaissance where I've scanned for roadmaps uh, on market and sort of engineering and technology development to see what is out in the assessment space on the public record. Um, and I've avoided any proprietary data so that's the sort of the, the nature of this particular presentation. It's gonna be a very quick high level overview of the McKinsey hydrogen roadmap that they published in 2020 in September. I'm gonna look um, as I skim through that and sort of highlight the upstream opportunities of natural gas adjacent to major oil and gas infrastructure where we've got carbon uh, capture and sequestration potential. Uh, which sort of puts the, the hydrogen production from natural gas into a relatively green space um, as we look at its price compared to other things and its uh, sort of green attractiveness. And also just look, you know, at some end uh, use market validations as I went through this that I thought were, were quite intriguing, particularly in the competition between electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles. I think there are some, some areas there that might be um, perhaps counterintuitive to what you might read in the mainstream media, but I think are very revealing about the hydrogen potential. Um, and then a few more recent observations after we skim through the McKinsey uh, roadmap, and then we'll move on to uh, the discussion phase. Uh, let's, let's just go ahead and dive in. Um, and let me, before I start, also encourage anyone who's interested to uh, download the presentation. And you'll see at the back, there are some appendices. And one of them that I think is very useful as you think about this presentation is the list of clients who were sponsors of the work for McKinsey. And I think the sort of the range there is of particular interest as you think about what we're, we're talking about today. Basically what McKinsey did was they put together an ambitious scenario for what the potential benefits of hydrogen would look like and a roadmap for how to get there. 
So that's not a prediction per se, or a sort of a market analysis. It's more of a market potential assessment. And it's, you know, it is a long run outlook. And I think as it's sort of backbone, it's designed around the notion that what did we learn from solar, wind, and energy storage on price and performance over a few decades of experience? And how might we apply those lessons to the hydrogen potential value chain that many of you recall um, really got its national prominence under President Bush? And so it subsequently had, there's a fair amount of work that's going on that may not be top of mind, but is out there. So with that, what are the, the basic pitches? Um, it has the potential to generate a lot of domestic revenue and domestic jobs with a locally produced energy resource. Um, it's a big selling point. It's low emission energy and it's local. And it has significant benefits with reduction of uh, basically air pollution and greenhouse gases. And it could take us a pretty good portion of the US demand. That's the basic pitch. Um, and where would that sort of action be um, as you look at the growth curve potential? I would offer that there really are um, transportation fuel is their big growth opportunity. And you'll see there I mentioned fuel cell electric vehicles, including the vans and light vehicles, medium trucks, trucks in the freight business and mining. And let me offer an observation right here about what's already happening, even though it doesn't show up in, the, in this sort of space yet as anything other than a sliver. Anheuser-Busch has a huge fleet vehicle for delivering its product around the United States. It has 10 fuel cell trucks ordered for every one electric truck it has ordered. It's 10 to one right now. And you'll see that if you, if you Google it, you'll find uh, there's an article in Forbes and there's a press release. So there's, there's some very interesting validations going on by people who have been in the logistics business for a long time and understand it. And they're making bets. So fuel cells in the electric space aren't just speculation, aren't just research. There's some commercialization activity happening and it's really quite interesting. The other area that I wanted to highlight here is ammonia is an area about which we actually have some experience in our fertilizer plant in Alaska. And it's an area that has received historically research by the power production side as a potential fuel to replace diesel because the NH3 does have a pretty good density compared to hydrogen. And so fuel handling characteristics and equipment to sort of build that up are not as ambitious as a hydrogen build out. So from time to time, I have seen in Alaska markets, examinations of whether ammonia as a, as a basically a mobile fuel, liquid fuel uh, might be an alternative that could be deployed. And that was explorations really looking at just a cost competition with diesel. Um, there's a whole bunch of sort of policy supports that they highlight. I'm gonna let people dive in and sort of see which ones are of interest. I don't know that I have much value to add here in terms of the discussion today. I think the interesting part is in the next slide for Alaska, and that's really looking at steam methane reforming as the technology to take natural gas feedstock and convert it to hydrogen. And you'll see in the appendix, um, there should be a, a, a chemistry uh, diagram to show you what that amounts to. And the knock on the steam um, methane reforming in the production of hydrogen is that it produces a lot of CO2. Okay, so you don't make much headway unless you sequester the carbon at the point of production. So if you're uh, producing hydrogen from a natural gas resource that is adjacent to a lot of 
potential storage caverns underground for carbon, there might be an interesting opportunity. And so that's really the, the space I think that people will, at least at a reconnaissance level, start exploring as they talk about well, what might be an on-ramp to hydrogen in Alaska, given some of our natural gas resources, where they're located, their scale, and ways to monetize that. It's, it's, in my mind, it's conceivable that one of the areas to at least explore on a reconnaissance basis truly is, can we take that gas under steam methane reforming and convert it and then get it to a market? So, and I highlight in yellow here, sort of the, the outlook that they see on where that development might occur over time. Um, the applications roadmap, they got a very pretty picture uh, in exhibit five in the McKinsey study. I've just put it into a block chart. Um, I wish I would have just cut and pasted the, the pretty picture. Let me highlight again that I think there's a lot of opportunity that's currently being exploited in material handling and forklifts. So it's already out there. This isn't like it's a new thing. And I continue to see fleet vehicles as they look across their options, being very intrigued by fuel cells relative to electric vehicles in the trucking industry. So I think there's some interesting sort of validations that are beginning to show up. Um, Clearly, the Department of Defense has an interest in fuel cell technology as you look across their portfolio. And so there may be some nice overlaps uh, with their development and deployment of some of those products in their vehicles. And you could, of course, test that in an Alaska marketplace and the Alaska market conditions. I think the other interesting thing that's mentioned explicitly is the rail sector. Uh, to the extent you wanted to convert the rail sector from its current fuel to an alternative fuel, uh, hydrogen fuel cells might be an interesting option or electrification using some amount of hydrogen in the natural gas stream or a complete conversion to hydrogen. So there's lots of sort of ways to get there. The price performance curves, of course, are the things of interest that need to be more fully developed and explored. Recognizing the big variable is how fast do we expect essentially that technology to get ramping up? And you'll see they've got a lot of R&D and uh, mm -hmm. pilot testing in their roadmap. And that's that's the big you know key is can we reach that sort of improvement in price and performance that we saw in solar and wind as we look back over the last 20 years. And so that's the pitch. Can this occur? And the answer is we don't know. But if we put a lot of money in, as is now occurring across many sectors, we're likely to see some improvements. And so how do you monitor and manage that in your portfolio? Hey, Mark, we do have a question. Sure. And this is from Marianne. Marianne, are there other countries leading the pack with uh, hydrogen applications? And what are the global implications? What's the status of uh, hydrogen development elsewhere? I would say there is significant hydrogen development around the world. Um, I continue to see daily in my diesel um, and gas turbine worldwide news feeds, a lot of European interest uh, in hydrogen. Uh, both in stationary power and in fuel cells and shipping industry. Um, and certainly, I think you'll detect, if you look carefully, uh, Japanese are very interested in expanding the market for that. Clearly, potential customers for Alaska uh, in the Pacific Rim looking at it. And we'll see further on uh, investments in Australia into the space in one of the charts further on. So, yeah, it's very international. Um, you know, at one point, I would say under President Bush, we probably had a, a lead. Uh, I don't believe that the U.S. probably has that lead today, um, but it's certainly possible for um, what I'll call the very robust commercial teams in the U.S. to catch up and pass if there's a commitment made on some of the policy features earlier. 
but you know that's a variable and who knows where that's going to go but i think there are some some possibilities there um the scale up uh is one of the um, that they've come up with they're looking at uh vehicle sales fueling stations basically for that that mobile fuel cell market um you know and and trying to say if you had an ambitious roadmap what might it look like um, and I think it's it really is quite interesting to see this roadmap and kind of compare it to the electric vehicle roadmap. And you really begin to see that there's a lot of potential for fuel cells. Uh, it tends to be up in the higher energy density requirements compared to the what we think of as our you know personal vehicle market. Um, and so we'll see what happens. But I think that's the that's the competition. Um, U.S. hydrogen market today, just to remind people, it's a real market. Uh, it exists today. There's a significant amount being produced. 77% of that market on the supply side is served by the methane reforming. And the price is on the range of $2 a kilogram. So it's a very interesting opportunity to knock against it under current deployments is it is a high greenhouse gas producer, it produces a lot of CO2. So the carbon capture and sequestration becomes critical in the formulation. Um, there's a quick view of, of where they sort of see the market potential along the value chain over time. Um, you know, basically they see it growing all through the value chain in this ambitious scenario. Um, perhaps not atypical of a report done for a wide variety of clients. I would commend to all of you the, um, the charts that talk about the market share of these various segments. For those who wanna drill down and understand where it's at and where it's going, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but I do think it's very revealing as you begin to get granular about where is it happening, where might it happen, um, and, and particularly within Alaska markets. Um, you know, and, and one thing that comes to mind beyond the, the stuff that we talk about, you know, vehicles and personal vehicles that might be run by fuel cells, if you look carefully down here, you'll see that we've got a lot of feedstock, excuse me, um in in the areas that's currently being used um as we fast forward to 2050 you'll see the growth in the markets that they projected and where they think things might happen i highlight for you one of the areas here that they think there might be some potential is hydrogen either as a mix or a feedstock for natural gas networks that get distributed for heating purposes. And you do see right now there are trials underway or announced both um, that blend hydrogen into natural gas distribution systems. So I think you'll see more of that, particularly in Northern Europe, where there's a sort of a high demand for clean fuels in their commitments to reducing greenhouse gas and an interest from the oil and gas sector there on building up their hydrogen capacity and figuring out how to basically build up their carbon sequestration um, and that production side. So I guess there's a lot of interesting places. It's really sort of into the granularity. Where is it? Where might it work in your particular location? Um, gives you a sense of where the hydrogen use is across the U.S. today. Um, a lot of it is within our oil and gas sector. They have a lot of knowledge on industrial process involving carbon, hydrogen, ammonia, and a lot of these areas that we're, we're familiar with. And despite the uh, sort of the notion that these some of these fuels might be outdated. I'm reminded of Sheikh Imani's famous quote, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. It ended because other technologies grew to take its place. Yet at the same time, 
we still have a lot of stone around that we use in various applications. So I do think there's a lot of, a lot of opportunity across the oil and gas sector to monitor and potentially build up their hydrogen production capacity as hydrogen markets grow for on the demand side around the world, depending on what particular place is decided they're gonna prioritize the policy, potential incentive packages, and then drive those that market development. Hey Mark, we have a couple of questions. Let me stop you. Um, sure. So what does a, a two, two kilograms equate to in terms of dollars per million BTUs? Um, there's a chart later on that, that shows you the cross comparison. We'll take a look at that when we get there. Okay. And um, all right, I'm gonna save these other two. Go ahead. Sure. Um, another pretty picture looking at how the market might uh, be developed. I encourage you to look at it uh, later. Uh, it's really looking at aviation and shipping. Um, clearly markets about which Alaskans are very interested in them for the, you know, the aviation markets that we have and the shipping markets that we're depending on. And so there's some potential for that to be a synergy if you develop those end use markets while you're also developing the production side you basically can get a local cycle of energy production and utilization and potentially reduce sort of the long-term transportation um, costs associated with fuel handling. Uh, they spend a lot of time in the report talking about electrolyzers as a place where you can see potential cost reductions over time. I mention it and highlight it here as something that's of interest. I'm gonna zoom through this at high speed because I don't see it as the core question about what might be next in the Alaska market. It might be there someday, but it's pretty far outside of the cost performance curve in my view at this point in time. So hold on to your seats. We're gonna flash a bunch of slides relatively fast, but I want you to know it's in there and so you can get to it. Um, Production cost scenarios are, I think, important if you're trying to compare the different production chains and recognize that even with carbon sequestration, the steam method reforming is likely to be competitive, continuing for quite some time. So it really is this horse race between different technologies. It's not one or the other. Uh, so you just want to be mindful of having enough granularity in whatever analysis you're looking at to understand that. Okay, getting to how do we need to get um, a competitive price in the market for hydrogen at, for example, a fueling station for residential cars? Swing back to the prior question. So that $2 production, how does it compare well, the short answer is at that point in the supply chain, it looks like, wow, we have a lot of opportunity. But remember, I've got to get it from that production place all the way up the chain to a distribution. Um, and so while that looks really competitive compared to the estimates of four to seven dollars per k kilogram to make a pump price competitive, um, we're still, probably on the range of twice that for the total supply chain. But potential for that supply chain to reduce. And you'll see, of course, corporate tax rates and other activities in R&D to help reduce the costs along that chain, all of which are in sort of interesting speculations. And then the question becomes, how much do you buy into that potential reduction across the value chain? over time based on worldwide investment in new tech in this space. But I do think we've gone from nascent investments to just a pretty interesting uptick in momentum, even in the last six months. Um, so I think it's, it's a lot more capital sort of heading into the space, hard to know exactly where it might start to yield benefits but clearly a lot of capital and a lot of interest. Getting to the international 
question raised earlier, allow me to, to share and just have people skim through the locations of the expected capacity installations for electrolyzers to give you a sense of the span of the international expectation around the world. And from my view, you know, I think we got competition from Australia if we're thinking about an Alaska play and, and we wanna be mindful of that. I think the other thing to be mindful of is Japan doesn't have any plays on the list that I could find. And so they're looking at suppliers. So how do we stack up? So that's, that's I think the, the interesting question to explore. Um, some stuff about uh, potential uh, growth scenarios and where you would expect to see fueling stations. You can enjoy the bi-coastal nature of their map and sort of smile at, at uh, all the implications associated with that. Um, then that we're into the appendices. I'm happy at this point to, to take a break and uh, let people start asking questions and I can share what limited knowledge I have from my quick scan and uh, just hope that it stimulates some uh, follow-up conversation. Thank you again for the opportunity, appreciate it. Great, thank you, thank you, Mark. Uh, we do have a number of questions uh, and uh, just as a follow-up to your, uh, what you just stated with regard to uh, in the capital investment necessary for um, hydrogen and the transition, what's the tipping point between fossil fuels and hydrogen or other non-fossil fuels? Uh, is there any speculation in the industry about, I mean, obviously we've seen some acceleration recently, but um, what are what would be the tipping point that you would see the uh, investment being migrating over to hydrogen or other alternative fuels? Yeah. If, if we just take the McKinsey um, sort of cost curve and cost reduction elements, um, they're really suggesting we need policy support for a decade um, before we get into this space where it's likely that you reduce the incentive packages, tax incentives, um, other R&D uh, sort of support, and it becomes more cost competitive with other elements Clearly the other driver is gonna be what kind of greenhouse gas regulation, tax, et cetera, that might be in play to also push it down. Um, but I, I, I think they're really accepting sort of a, a decade is the, um, is the development timeline before you get into uh, that space where you reduce the support. The, um, Trying to think if there's another report that also takes a look at that same thing, and I just don't have it top of mind, but I think there's another one that kind of validates um, independently uh, that view that McKinsey laid out. Sure, thank you. Um, we also have a question uh, from Alan Mitchell. Uh, with regard to the um, steam methane reforming process, what's the uh, energy efficiency of that uh, transition process from methane? To let, me, let me see if I got that. Look at slide uh, 20. Um, you should see the energy efficiency of that process, at least in that reference there, um, was about 75%. And I saw a couple others that referenced that, but I have not independently verified that by just going through my chemistry um, and, and doing my energy balance, which I <clears throat> probably want to do at some point. But thank you for the <laughs> question, Alan. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, Mead has raised his hand. Uh, Mead, you want to open up your mic and ask your question, please? Yeah, thanks. Uh, hey, uh, Mark, this has been wonderful. Uh, a, a couple of things. Uh, I was Lieutenant Governor when we shifted from Bush to Obama, or I, uh, actually, I, I, Obama was president when I became Lieutenant Governor, and I'd helped create the U.S. Iceland Hydrogen Partnership, and we've done a lot of things. And and uh, the first Obama Secretary of Energy, who was a Nobel laureate, got on a call with a bunch of lieutenant governors and said, "Ah, there's no future for hydrogen in the immediate sense. Uh, that's why I'm cutting hydrogen funding." And it was kind of a bummer because we had a number of things going on that had options, and uh, you know, we had a we had a. a energy innovation fund at the time in the first couple of years when oil prices were high. We had an ammonia project. We had a, a couple of uh, electrolysis uh, projects. And and uh, he, he, he said, nah, you just ought to use your uh, spare spare power to heat water. 
that's that's the problem. Now, I, I, I agree with you, frankly, and I'm glad to see the McKinley study. Uh, I, I just wanted to point out that when we get to steam reforming, I've been doing a lot of uh, looking at catalytics. And uh, there's a company called Hazer, H-A-Z-E-R Limited in Australia, a public company that is figured out if you run hot natural gas through iron ore uh, and let it sit there for 40 minutes, uh, you get all the fluffy graphite that you want, commercial grade falling out of the natural gas and you can put hydrogen right in the power plant. So you can do that at the power plant and use your gas distribution system. Uh, you can also bubble natural gas up through tin and uh, you'll get carbon black uh, at the top of uh, molten tin and hydrogen bubbling off. Uh, and I've been looking at some new electrolysis uh, attempts too. There was a disastrous one that uh, New Brunswick Power did, but uh, uh, I, I think there's opportunities there. there. I asked the question about the $2 per kilogram, what it equates to, uh, because the Hazer process thinks they basically will have a 30% parasite on the uh, power value of the natural gas delivered. And that's somewhat equivalent to some of the power, uh, some of the carbon cost tax ideas. Um, and second, I would just like to see us figure out if there's a way we could do a power uh, or a pilot plant with some of this, maybe at Prudhoe Bay where gas has not got a price yet generally. Um, and there's a huge amount of electric power used and uh, the more we can make that oil field greener, probably the better. Uh, I had one more comment or two, two more comments. Japan has done a number of coal to hydrogen projects from Australia where they're importing liquid hydrogen. Uh, and I, I'm not sure that that's gonna get where, where it needs to go. Uh, we are uh, at the Alaska Alberta Railway. We are now doing a lot of work on hydrogen powered engines. Uh, as, as kind of a green fuel for that. But the question I had for you is on fuel cells, is there any kind of combo fuel cell that's either H2 and CH4 together or uh, uh, doing it with CH4, but doing it in such a way that you've got, got an easier way to sequester your carbon? And uh, thanks, thanks for let, let me spout off, but. No, thank you, there. Mead, for, uh, for leading the, uh, sort of what I'll call the uh, R&D and commercialization uh, investigations in this area. Um, and I do recall at the time, the Secretary of Energy <clears throat> coming on board and, and sending hydrogen to the back bench. I think in retrospect, he doesn't look like he was quite as foresightful as he uh, may have purported to be at the time. So I do think there's a lot of value in, in looking at the horizon on this, particularly given just the amount of international capital that's coming to play. To your immediate question about the fuel cells, um, I have looked at fuel cells in particular because I'm really curious about putting them in here at my house because my huge energy demand and in the course of doing that, I did not see any fuel cells in the market um, along the lines you described. It looks like they're truly focused on how do I extend the energy density within the H2 space? Um, I haven't seen the CH4 H2 combos. Um, could, could, you start, could you start with the CH4? Um, and, you know, put a fuel cell in your house on natural gas, and then when hydrogen becomes available, just uh, still have the same machine? I haven't seen it. Um, I want, and I want to just sort of step through how much of the machine, or, you know, you could have a shell and you could pull, put a cell in, pull a cell out. Um, but what key components could you essentially capture the cost of infrastructure on so that the plug and play is a modest sort of cost increment? It, it almost feels to me just intuitively like I'm sort of, I buy a car and I'm putting in an engine, pulling it out, putting another engine in. Um, but there may be some other ways you could refine that down. I just haven't seen it. Okay, um, uh, just for everybody online uh, as well, if you uh, wanna ask a question directly, you can raise your hand and wait for me to call on you, please. Um, and one, one other place to look, by the way, Mead, if you haven't already, is the MIT Energy Initiative. And you'll see they have their, their frequently have conferences. 
And if you drill down through that document stack, I found it's a rich source of technical information. And especially if you've got the time to chase the threads um, of the individual presenters and look at some of the additional work that they've done is frequently where, I, where I'm finding the ahas um, about what people are exploring on sort of that uh, frontier of what's possible with the technology. Okay, any other questions from uh, participants? Okay, I don't see anybody raising their hands. I'm, I'm gonna ask you a speculative question, um, Mark. Are you familiar, there was an old MMS uh, scenario with uh, geothermal energy being converted to hydrogen and stored in uh, uh, silica formations in the Alaska Peninsula. It, does, does that have any uh, future in the uh, hydrogen energy regime? Um, I don't know. And in my mind, I'm splitting it into two pieces. Um, having looked in some detail at geothermal opportunities um, and the challenge on the geothermal side is the cost of finding a robust resource tends to be quite a bit higher than um, a drilling, ex an exploration and development uh, program in oil and gas. Mm -hmm. and I think that's where we frequently overestimate our ability to get to um, I think particularly cost competitive geothermal resources. So too, so too difficult to actually characterize. On the geothermal side, on the um, carbon capture and sequestration, I think the, uh, the market for that is gonna continue to grow. And partly I, what I'm seeing is the renewable greenhouse gas, let's kind of convert our energy system advocates are starting to specifically address carbon capture and sequestration in their models and go, please don't, oil and gas industry, please don't spend all your resources there. Please join us in this quest for renewables. And I think what they're doing is basically acknowledging that the oil and gas industry has a lot of embedded assets, talents, and knowledge that in fact is well positioned to develop carbon capture and sequestration. And it's very likely that will be a significant portion of the portfolio. Um, and I think, what was it? The Financial Times from a couple of days ago, you'll see the International Renewable Energy Agency produced its updated report um, looking at the shift away from fossil fuels. And they conceded Natural gas as a feedstock for hydrogen might be around for a while. And they wanted to encourage people not to spend all of their capital chasing that down and the carbon sequestration associated with making that green. Um, I think that's, a, that's a, a big flag that in fact, that's where they see the market going in the near term. Okay. All right, I think I just found that article. Um, uh, let me just post that for everyone. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I don't see any other questions for Mark. Um, so I'm going to turn it back to Marianne. Uh, Marianne. Oh, I'm sorry. One, one last point. Mead, let us know if we can help you. Because I, I well, really appreciate well, the work that you're doing and trying to develop our resources. Well, we can. It, just, just one other thing to what you were just saying about natural gas. Um, if, if you just look at uh, LNG alone, there's about 350 million tons of LNG traded globally. Uh, for every 4 million tons, you've probably got about $6 billion. So uh, multiply that, that's, that's a trillion dollars of infrastructure out there that, that could be used. And if you add up gas pipelines, you've got a tremendous amount. We're not gonna run out of methane anytime soon. Um, and, and uh, it is the easiest of the fossil fuels to decarbonize. Um, the other thing that just should be recognized is, is we have people wanting to go war and leave all fossil fuels in the ground is that uh, uh, over 60% of the greenhouse gas savings in the power industry worldwide have come from the coal to gas shift. 
Okay. And we've still got a lot more of that to do while we make these technologies work and make them more economic. And, and uh, I'm, as somebody who's in the natural gas industry, I'm very, very interested in seeing sequestration technologies advance. And my only recommendation, and I'm saying this to you, Marianne, as, as head of our energy committee, is I think we ought to come up with kind of a, a collection of potential Alaska pilot projects uh, that help make the case here, uh, which does not abandon, uh, you know, kind of move into, uh, there's some places where we have spare renewable energy that can make, you know, inefficient electrolysis. And I, I, I support that. There's geothermal as, as, as Marianne talked about, but I think this state really needs a kind of a, 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 a plan. I don't, I don't even want to call it a transition plan. I'll just say a, an enhancement plan and I kind of think we're about where we were in 1970 when people didn't think we could afford it, kind of like converters on our car. We figured out how to make it work. And uh, that's, that's what we have to be thinking about. So okay. anyway, thank, thank you very much. Okay, and, we do have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, so Jim Strandberg, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Let me figure out how to unmute. You're unmuted. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, Mark, uh, good to hear your presentation, and uh, uh, thanks for your altruistic view of the hydrogen, hydrogen future. My question is, um, from a state-level research standpoint, um, what does our energy organ, Alaska Energy Authority, think about a hydrogen future? I will defer to, uh, to the organization for their, their perspective. I have not had a chance to run it down, Jim. Web page and typed in a search for hydrogen and came up with nothing. <laughs> <laughs> just a little right, yeah, I, I just want to encourage everyone to, to consider, uh, I think needs, depth, and breadth, I think are, uh, are very important um, to the success of our future energy development in the state. And I think we want to try and support uh, the efforts that he has underway and particularly putting together, I think, a, a list of pilot projects to be part of an enhancement plan, I think would be an excellent way to stimulate a dialogue about what might be next and how could we help support that. Great, thank, thank you so much. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Mark. Um, we have a question from Bernie. Bernie, do you want to go ahead and uh, open your mic? Uh, uh, yeah, Mark. Uh... Uh, could you kind of give a, a description of the different types of hydrogen? We have, you know, I've read uh, reports that have blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, uh, and uh, gray hydrogen, which is the gray is the natural gas and cold. The blue is, uh, I guess, uh, uh, from underground formation. Maybe uh, you're talking about uh, a geothermal. And then, then they have one that's called the clear hydrogen, which is extracting hydrogen from water. Uh, so are, are any of those more feasible than others uh, that you know about right now? I would say at this point, the, uh, the race is on across that spectrum of production. I think the, the hydrogen production to serve existing markets is continuing to expand as people produce fuel cells for vehicles, uh, the Anheuser-Busch example. Um, and I think it's the growth in policy and policy support and greenhouse gas regulation that will continue to push capital and markets toward exploring the, uh, the hydrogen that's produced by electrolysis from renewable energy sources. So its value chain is basically clean or the hydrogen produced from the steam methane reforming and various catalytic sort of variations there where you've got to capture that carbon and, and plant it back. I think the race is on. I think steam reforming is ahead um, with carbon sequestration. As much skepticism, I think, as you'll find in the popular press and, and various critiques, I think carbon sequestration is going to see more activity in the hydrogen space around the world. Okay, and Marianne has a question. 
Yeah, hey, Mark, um, I think kind of following up a little bit on what Mead was indicating, uh, we've seen recently that BP has certainly embraced moving to some sort of a uh, renewable agenda and a hydrogen focus by 2030. Is it going to take the majors like the Exxon Mobiles of the world, the BPs of the world to get behind this so that the dollar price point, the economics of what we're talking about truly is a game changer rather than something that's more theoretical? Um, if you're scanning the Wall Street Journal and Financial Times and Bloomberg and Barron's, I think you may have noticed over the last couple of weeks, articles describing the market capitalization of renewable companies versus the old oil and gas majors. I think the game is already afoot. And for the oil and gas majors to continue to build market, basically price and market cap as they uh, look for growth opportunities, I think the the buy side of the capital market is telling them they need to shift more resources in this direction. And many of them are doing it. And I think the other sort of thing you'll see is that some second and third tier oil and gas companies are explicitly saying, we are not going there. We're gonna focus on the bread and butter that has brought us to where we're at today. And as I watch that sort of the the capital markets respond to that differentiation that's growing. I'm struck by how the growth focused technology companies um, appear to be doing better. And it shouldn't be a surprise. If you look carefully back at Alaska's oil and gas history, directional drilling, a technology that was instrumental in enabling us to reach more and more resource on the North Slope really became a focus of the majors that we had, Exxon, BP, Conoco, Arco Time, characterizing themselves to the capital markets as we are technology companies. For us to grow, we need to compete on creating sustainable competitive advantage in growing technologies to more efficiently and productively explore, develop, produce through the mid, um, sort of their mid chain and you know, to the downstream products and across their value chain. And that's the business they've been in for decades. If you look at how they report to their shareholders, so I think the majors are already well underway in that transition. It's the, the next tier who are having to decide, can we compete in that space, which requires fairly sophisticated um, talent management systems to get, get captured, create competitive advantage in the technology and really get shareholder value um, compared to the next tier who go, no, maybe I'll stick to the, the traditional area. So I think there'll be a plenty of stonemasons left, but I think the, the new technology and builders are um, gonna have a bigger market. And I think the market's already pointing in that direction. Very good, very good. Okay, well, I, Marianne, I don't see any additional questions coming in, um, but I'll just to turn it back to you for any final comments. All right, so fantastic uh, presentation, Mark, as always. And um, Mead, I see you've given me a homework assignment and it's always good because I'm gonna loop some of the professors in, Mark, uh, in the discussions as we uh, look at what we're going to look at in 2021. Um, I, I think we're gonna probably try and squeeze in one more energy uh, meeting before the end of the year. And it's probably going to be with uh, John Hendricks talking about uh, the renaissance with the Fury acquisition and the turnaround of that Cook Inlet asset. So I wish all of you a wonderful weekend. Uh, please stay in tune for our next meeting. And Mark, thank you again for your wonderful insight and need. Greatly appreciate your participation as well. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mark.